It's good to see the room packed this morning. Yeah, it is. It seems like uh, we've had more people here this morning than our usual Sunday, so I praise Jesus for that. Yeah. Uh, I just want to open us up in some prayer. I want us to posture our hearts and, and understand um, that we're here to encounter God this morning. I hope that we came into this place with that posture. And so let's pray. Yeah, I know you're doing stuff, Jesus. I know you're moving in our hearts this morning. That's not just some, some fake thing that, that we just talk about. God is moving. No, Jesus, I know that you're here. I know that you're moving. I know that uh, you're taking us deeper with you. You're drawing us to yourself with unfailing love. You want us to experience the fullness of life that is found in you. You want us to experience the fullness of purpose that is found in you. You want our hearts to be lifted to you, Jesus, just lifting you high and exalting you and and enjoying you and worshiping you. And I just pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, we would be resolute to your cause. We would be conformed to you and what you're doing, that we wouldn't leave here playing God of our lives, that we wouldn't leave here um, wanting to fulfill our own plans, but that we would encounter you in such a way, that we would encounter the manifest presence of God in this place this morning, and it would change us forever, and we would leave here as living and holy sacrifices for you, Jesus, that, that we would just be in complete submission to you, giving it all to you, Jesus, going, here I am, take all of me, I, I hold nothing back, I put myself in your hands, that's the best place we can be in Jesus. So as we pray right now, as we lead into worship, as we hear the message, continue to break down that hardness on our hearts, that we would be brought to a place of surrender by the time the service ends. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so... We're not here this morning, guys, to just hear um, some music. We're not here uh, just to hear <coughs> Lucas uh, say some things. Uh, we're here because Jesus wants us. He wants our hearts. Like I prayed, he's drawing us to himself with unfailing love. And are our hearts this morning in a place where we're saying, take it, my Lord, the King, and use it as you wish. Take my life and use it as you wish. I will give it all to you. I'll give it all to you. I'm entrusting myself to you. And I want to remind us um, that Jesus is, he is worthy 
to have all of us. And I want to read something um, that I read this morning. And I think this paints a pretty clear picture of what it looks like to be possessed by Jesus. There's a challenge here. Are you sure this morning that you want to be possessed by God? That that your hand, that your life entrusted into the hands of God? Are you sure that you want to be possessed by a spirit who, while he is pure and gentle and wise and loving, will yet insist upon being Lord of your life? Are you sure you want your personality to be taken over by the one who will require obedience to his written word? Who will not tolerate any of the self-sins in your life, self-love, self-indulgence, self-sufficiency, so on and so forth. Who will not permit you to strut or boast or show off. Who will take the direction of your life away from you and will reserve the sovereign right to test you and discipline you. Who will strip away from you many loved objects which secretly harm your soul. Unless you can answer an eager yes to these questions, you do not want to be filled this morning. You may want the thrill or the victory or the power, but you do not really want to be filled with the Spirit. Your desire is a little more than a feeble wish and is not pure enough to please God, who demands all or nothing. And so I just want to remind us that as we give ourselves to Jesus this morning, it will cost something. Dying to self sometimes hurts. Well, I guess I could say all the time it hurts. But I want to remind us of the one to whom we're entrusting ourselves to. I think when we look at what I just read and we shy away from that, we're like, I'm not sure. I don't know if I want to entrust myself to Jesus. It's because we have a skewed perception of who he is. We have forgotten or maybe we just don't know that his ways are absolutely perfect, that, that his love is absolutely unfailing. And, and, and we, have, we have drifted away from that if, if our answer is no to those things. And so as we go into worship, I just want us reminded of who Jesus is and the one to whom we're entrusting ourselves to. And I want us to count the cost this morning and go, it's a resounding yes for me. Like, where else would I go? Like, like I'm only safe in your hands. You're my refuge. You're my strength. And so as we lead in the song, let's just um, <laughs> stare into the face of who Jesus is, okay? You guys can stand.
and draw me closer. Draw me closer. say about that song with Jesus, if we actually take the time to get to know him, that's that's where it's at. Just take the time to get to know him and everything's different. It's changed. So um, I you know, just ask him to show you who he is and he'll do that.
that's all we got this morning for song, guys. But I just want to leave us as we transition into hearing the word of God. Challenge yourself right now. Is your cup empty? I remember Ken as he... I remember as we started having our own services. And Ken, he, he would always give like this intro... Um, before his message and it was just something that Jesus has put on his heart and, and I remember going back and just watching his intros because they were so good but I remember he would always say we, we cannot be filled in this place unless we're empty we just can't we can't and some of us here you feel like you're empty and, and you're like man I, I, I feel like you know I'm just not full I don't feel like I have life I feel like I'm enslaved to addiction, but are you empty of yourself? And if we're empty of ourselves this morning, guys, and as we hear the word of God, if we devote ourselves to it, and we believe and we cling to the Lord and his teaching, and we can leave here and we can be filled. We can truly be filled, and it won't be with self. It will be with the spirit of God. Rivers of living water will burst from our hearts. We'll be experiencing the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Couple extra people here this morning. Time. Praise Jesus for that. Um, appreciate, Billy, what you read before uh, going into worship time there or song, because um, it is uh, it, kind of what we're going to go over this morning. I think uh, you'll see that as we follow Jesus, uh, it impacts every area of our life and requires uh, everything of us, and it's all connected, right? Um, every part of following Jesus and submitting ourselves to him is connected to a hundred percent of us so the word of God affects our lives in a 360 degree way it should affect the way we live what we do what we say all of these things and so um, if you guys would uh, go ahead and turn to James 3 this morning uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and pray here yeah, so Jesus, I just thank you and I praise you for the opportunity to gather together in your name. Um, as Billy kind of alluded to, uh, nobody, nobody needs to come here to hear my words, uh, Lord. But, uh, you know, we, we need to come together uh, to hear your words. And so, Lord, I just uh, want to submit uh, my heart and my mouth to you during this time. Pray that you would work in and through me and in and through the hearts of all of those here as we go through your word this morning. I thank you and praise you, Jesus, for the transforming work you've already begun in many of the people sitting in this room. And I just pray, Lord, as they uh, draw closer to you, that you would continue to uh, reveal truth to them and strengthen them so that their lives will reflect you in every way. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. So we're going to be in James 3 this morning. Uh, chapter, yeah, chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 2 and going down through verse 12. So go ahead and read that. And then uh, we'll get started. So it says, uh, Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing, 
that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. <clears throat> and so this morning, uh, obviously, we're going to be talking about the tongue, but it really, as we go through this, I think uh, you will see that it, it connects to a lot more than that. Uh, that it goes into um, everything in our lives uh, connecting together as we are uh, supposed to live our lives uh, honoring Jesus. And so in verse 2, he talks about the fact that we all make many mistakes. And he says if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and be able to control ourselves in every other way. That's a huge statement. And I think uh, we would all admit this morning that we all stumble in a lot of ways, that we all make many mistakes uh, in our relationships that we have. Uh, I know in our finances, the way that we handle money and the things that God gives us, um, in our uh, interactions with other believers in the body of Christ. But the important thing here is if we can't control what comes out of our mouth, then it impacts everything that we do and everything in our life. It's interesting because as you dig deeper into this, one way that you can tell and that you can measure and, and take the temperature of where someone's at with Jesus is by seeing what comes out of their mouth. And so the amazing thing about the tongue, it's three inches long on average, right? The, the part of our tongue that comes out of our mouth. And compare that to the size of us, and it has a tremendous amount of power. With our, with our mouth, we can either encourage people or discourage people. We can either tell healing words to somebody who's struggling with something, or we can wound them deeper. Uh, we can either direct somebody on the right path to follow Jesus, or we can lie to them and deceive them and send them on the wrong path. We can either inspire people with our tongues and what we say, or we can demoralize them and put them down. We can either preach truth, truth or falsehood, and we can either build people up or we can rip people down to the ground by what comes out of our mouth. How we use our tongues and what we say provides a clear evidence of where we are spiritually with Jesus. What comes out of our mouth is usually an accurate picture of what's actually in our heart, and that's what I mean by when I, when I say everything is connected when we're following Jesus. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says, whatever is in your heart determines what you say. And so what comes out of our mouth is a clear picture of what resides in here. The other thing uh, is that um, controlling your tongue, as I said, it being a, a clear picture of where you are with Jesus, I think, you know, there's many people that claim to follow Jesus and are into checking boxes and doing things, right? Like growing up in the church, uh, there was a high value placed on attending church, on being at church on Sunday and going to Sunday school and being part of all these things. Or, you know, um, with all of us in the house, it might be showing up for Bible study with a good attitude and sitting through uh, listening to the word or um, might be going through different stages of the way that we're checking off and saying, you know, hey, we're good, right? Um, but in James one twenty six, 
uh, James goes back to the importance of controlling what we say. He says, if you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. So what that's saying is that many of us who claim to follow Jesus are wasting our time doing a lot of religious activity, a lot of things that we're checking the box on, but our mouth is making a hot mess of things. And it's causing problems that don't reflect Jesus working in our lives. And this is, this is huge because that means what we say, how we say it, and when we say it directly affects our entire life and the lives of those around us, right? And it affects even more so our testimony for Jesus. So James gives us a few examples in this section of scripture that we read that really paint a clear picture of this. When I was uh, probably 14 or 15, my family went and visited a Mennonite farm, and um, the Mennonites I know now in my life don't fit the Mennonites whose farm I went to visit. The Mennonite farm we went to was kind of like Amish light, right? Like they were allowed uh, to talk on the phone, they were allowed to watch TV, but they were still, um, you know, they didn't have a car, they used buggies and horses and all that stuff. So, so we went to this Amish farm, and one of the guys uh, that was there asked me, hey, do you, do you want to ride a horse? I've never been on a horse before, right? So, yeah, of course, I want to ride a horse. I have visions of, like, riding across the field, jumping over stuff, you know, and all this. Well, <clears throat> he took me out to the middle of the field and had me help me up on the horse. And the second my butt hit the saddle, the horse took off. <laughs> Full blast, straight to the barn. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter how much I yelled stop. The thing wasn't stopping. It wasn't, it wasn't doing anything. It was out of control. Contrast that to the next year that we visited them, and we visited them like two or three times. The, the second time we went and visited them, we, had a, we were sitting there, and he said, Hey, uh, I know you rode the horse last year, and it got a little crazy, but this year, you know, do you want to control the horse from the seat of the buggy? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. That sounds like fun. I'd never driven a buggy before, and so that sounded pretty cool. And so this time, he hooked the horse up. It was a different horse. Hooked the horse up, put the bit in its mouth, put the reins on and the bridle, and I sat in the seat. He handed me the reins, and he told me to get the horse to go. You just snap the reins, and it'll start going. If you want it to go right, you pull on it and it goes right. If you want it to go left, you pull on it and it'll go left. And if you want to stop, you just pull both reins back a little bit. And that's exactly what happened. That little bit in the horse's mouth helped it to be under control. It kept it under control. The horse obeyed and did everything that I wanted it to by pulling on the reins. And even though you, you realize a horse is about 50, average horse is about 1,500 pounds. That's pretty big. A bit that fits in the horse's mouth is a small piece of metal. It's tiny. And that's the analogy between our tongue and, and us, right? Like, as the bit controls the horse, um, our tongue, you know, we need to be control, or we need to have control over our tongue. And so an unbridled tongue, just like an unbridled horse, if that horse had run, if I'd fallen off, I had visions when I was on that horse of getting my foot caught in the stirrup and being dragged to death. You know, um, an unbridled horse can cause serious damage to your life and the lives of, of people in its path. But a bridled horse, on the other hand, like that one on the buggy, just like a tongue that's controlled, can have a tremendously positive impact on your life and your testimony for Jesus. James also talks about a ship with a rudder. I don't know if you guys have seen these big cargo ships that are just massive. If you've ever seen pictures of them. Now, the biggest cargo ship I could find when I looked it up on the internet is about 1,300 feet long. That's four, roughly uh, just shy of about three and a half football fields, right? That's a, that's a pretty long, uh, huge ship. But a rudder for a ship 
is only of that size only takes up about 2% of the size. That massive ship is controlled by something. If you put three football fields together, that's only the size of part of one of the engines. That's huge. And so, you know, that, that rudder, just like the bridle and the horse, will steer the ship or the horse for good or bad. In Proverbs 12, 17 to 19, it says, uh, it contrasts the difference between good and bad uh, when it talks about the tongue. And so um, it says, an honest witness tells the truth, but a false witness tells lies. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are exposed. And then Proverbs 15, 1 and 2 also contrasts these two things. It says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing, but the mouth of the fool belches out foolishness. Gentle words are a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. There's keys in these verses of where we're going to go with what our words should sound like as we move forward uh, and go through this. So just like the bridle and the rudder in these analogies, God has given us our tongue, and what we say, how we say it, and when we say it can steer the course of our lives and affect everything. The second analogy that he gives is about a fire, right? That the tongue is a fire. And I was reading and looking into this, and I found out that on July 27, 2018, the largest wildfire by acreage in California history was sparked by a single spark. There was a guy who was hammering in uh, some fence posts, metal fence posts with a metal hammer, and as he was hammering him in, uh, a spark flew off of one of his fence posts and landed in some dry brush and started a fire. <laughs> The result of that fire um, that was started by a single spark, uh, it, it cost the life of a firefighter. It burned more than 410,000 acres of California. Just that one spark caused that. And more than 280 structures were completely destroyed just by one spark. And it, the amazing thing about that is not so much the damage, although that's horrible, the amount of time that it takes for things to recover, once that fire has gone through and destroyed everything, it takes a very, very long time. Uh, on average, for land to recover from a wildfire, it takes 11 years for everything to recover after fire has gone through and destroyed everything. And I think if you're tracking with this, you're understanding the analogy James is making uh, by talking about how our tongues can do that kind of damage. Have you guys ever experienced that in your life? Not a literal wildfire, but a fire lit by something you said. Maybe it was a wrong word at a wrong time. Uh, could have been a, a statement that was said in order to purposely hurt someone. Um, didn't have to be an entire paragraph to cause damage. It could just be a single word. And a lot of times when we use our mouth to, to, to do these things, um, a lot of times it's one word catches fire to another word, which catches fire to another word, and before you know it, relationships are completely destroyed. Uh, you've, you've hurt people in ways you couldn't imagine. And uh, why is it, why do you think it is that our words and our tongue can truly cause that much damage. How, how is it that one word can, can cause years of damage? I can think of people that I know who, you know, something was said to them that years later, it still affects the way they feel when they think about it, the way that, um, you know, uh, the consequences of, of words can be uh, tremendous. Well, James tells us uh, later on that the tongue is a fire that's set on uh, fire by hell itself. And so 
the reason why our tongues and our, our words can do so much damage is, is that Satan is waiting for an opportunity to use our mouth and influence our, our, our words. When you or I speak, he's looking at an opportunity to take something that could be a spark, and once it's released, uh, fan it into flames. He purposefully looks for ways to dump fuel and gasoline on the fire to cause damage in other people's lives and in our life. And before you know it, that damage is bigger than you could ever imagine. I think uh, we could see this um, in, and I forgot to put the reference here, but uh, there's a story about this in, in Scripture. Um, Acts 5, that's what it is, Acts 5. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira. And so, um, I'll go ahead and read part of that here real quick. So, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. And this is the part to pay attention to, because we remember that Jesus says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so Peter said, Ananias... Why have you let Satan fill your heart? So his heart was filled by Satan. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And that caused him to lie. And you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. After selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. So that is, a, that is a picture, as I was going through this, of how Satan, looking for an opportunity, even in believers' lives, to put something in our hearts to cause us to use our mouth to sin. So another part of this would be uh, towards the end of this passage, when we start talking about, um, you know, the, the, the contradiction between uh, the different examples, the, the spring with fresh and salt water, the, the fig tree that can't produce apples, right? Um, it's talking about uh, we can't be double-minded, right, or double-tongued. And so just as we don't want to be double-minded or two-spirited, um, we shouldn't be double-tongued. God didn't design us uh, to be that way. We were created in his image, right, in his likeness. And once we surrender our lives completely to Jesus, the Holy Spirit then lives within us. And the Holy Spirit is not double-tongued. Obviously, he's not two-spirited either. When God chose to create something out of nothing, what did he do? He spoke. In Genesis 1-3, it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God used his words to create everything. So he wanted to teach, God wanted to teach Adam how to live life. And so the way that he did that, he gave Adam his word. Because Adam was created in God's image, God, Adam was also given speech. We were given speech. Animals can't speak. They don't use words to talk. We do as humans. And we were created in God's image. But however, with God's words come life, Satan brought death when he convinced Adam and Eve to believe the words, his words and question God's. Words can save lives or from the same source, our tongue and our heart, they can light a fire of destruction, as we've talked about. God tells us that's not how it should be in this book, in this chapter or section of James. We're made in his image. And so because we're made in his image, we're supposed to model Jesus in everything we do. And that means modeling and reflecting the character of Jesus. We are his messengers, his followers of Jesus. Keep in mind, though, that Satan obviously recognizes this, too. And so it makes sense that he's going to do everything he possibly can to, going back to Ananias and Sapphira, trip us up and cause us our mouth not to be used 
for God. So why is this important to us as followers of Jesus? Why is all of this important to um, you know what Jesus wants to do uh, with us as believers and with his church and the body of Christ? One of the most important roles of the body of you know, of one of our most important roles in the body of Christ and in the relationships with each other as followers of Jesus involves something called edification. Edification, the definition I found when I looked this up, was the act of one who promotes another's growth in Christian wisdom, happiness, and holiness. It's a process of building each other up in the church. And I think this is important because, you know, um, you guys, uh, a lot of you guys in the house and girls in the house, you have a kind of a special relationship and a special situation in that you're around each other an awful lot, <coughs> like you live together, like a family. And so as we go through this part, I just want you to think, how does this play into your day-to-day -day life as a body of Christ with other believers? Um, you know, what, what is it that Jesus wants to do in us and so um, one of the primary ways obviously that we build each other up and can edify each other is with our mouth with the words that we say um, that even goes to today because they didn't have that stuff back then things we post on social media things we text each other um, and even when we pray with each other together we're saying words to Jesus um, that should edify and, and, and build up. And so the Bible is pretty clear that as members of, of God's family, as members of the body of Jesus, we are supposed to be more like construction workers and not a demolition crew, right? We're supposed to help, um, you know, build us up and strengthen each other. And so Jesus tells us this in, in several places. So in Ephesians 4.29, he says, uh, don't use foul, and the word there for foul in the Greek is uh, rotten or worthless uh, or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So we're supposed to watch what we say, that everything that comes out of our mouth should be good and helpful, contributing to the building up of the body of Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says, Encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. So again, encouragement, building each other up, uh, is, is one of the main functions of our mouth as it relates to other members of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4.16 says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Again, helping each other grow. Hebrews 3.13, you must warn in the NLT, in other versions it says you must encourage each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. So we can see very clearly as it pertains to other believers in the body of Jesus, our role is should be one of encouragement. Our role as we live together, as we pour into each other on a daily basis, our words towards each other should be encouraging, should be good and helpful, should point each other to Jesus, so that the whole body of Christ can be built and strengthened. That's our role. If we've claimed to follow Jesus, that's our role. And that's not just in the church, that's also in our relationships. If you're married or if you know you have a, a you're in a relationship, um, you know, encouraging and building each other up as, as fellow believers. Um, it's extremely important. Now, if you listen to all of this and you said great I'm doing that with believers but you know with unbelievers uh, you know I don't have to worry about that so much I would say that the Bible says otherwise in uh, regarding unbelievers when you come 
and in contact with people who don't believe. There's, there's things there as well that Scripture says. Our life is to be a testimony for Jesus. Our life should reflect the character of Jesus in everything we do and everyone we come in contact with in every interaction that we have with people. And so 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15, um, this kind of what, what talks about more what our relationship with unbelievers should be, but then the verses following it talk about how we are to communicate and speak with them. And so 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15 warns us that we are not to team up with those who are unbelievers because how can, un or how can righteous be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? And what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And so there's a warning there not to have really close fellowship and relationships with unbelievers, with those who don't believe. However, in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, we are told that we are to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Our conversation should be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. And in 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 25, it says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people and gently instruct those who oppose the truth. And so even when we are around people who don't believe or don't follow Jesus, our words <laughs> need to reflect Jesus. We are supposed to, um, as Scripture tells us, be gracious, be kind, gently instruct, even when people don't agree with what we're saying. And so how does this flow into our entire life? If you remember uh, earlier on here in the message, Jesus said that out of our heart, our mouth speaks. And in Scripture, there's an analogy um, where Jesus talks about our heart being like a tree. And our words are like the fruit of that tree. And he's telling us that the fruit of our mouth and the words that we speak will always reflect the condition of our heart. And so if you are someone that is dishing out hurtful speech, if we follow what this says, then that would say we have a hurtful heart. If we gossip, and the Bible has a lot to say about gossip, about talking about people behind their back, or you know, talking about people who aren't present, and, and uh, you know, sharing falsehoods about, about things like that. If we gossip, and the words out of our mouth are, are gossiping words, that says we have a gossip's heart. If we slander people and speak badly of people, that's what our heart looks like. And therefore, if, if we're trying to fix our mouth and what we say without changing our heart and allowing the Lord and the Holy Spirit to change our heart, we're going to fail. It may work for a day or two. I think, uh, you know, how many of us have uh, tried to change behavior in our lives um, on our own. I think everybody's hand could be up, right? But we recognize the only thing that really changes us is, is Jesus changing our heart, right? And so uh, the most important part is not managing the symptom of <laughs> the words, but changing the heart, and the, the mouth will follow. And so... Um, Matthew 12, that's where Jesus talks about this tree and the heart and about words all together. So Matthew 12, 33, he says, uh, A tree is identified by its fruit, and if a tree is good, its fruit will be good. But if a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil per person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. 
the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. And so the importance of what comes out of our mouth and how that reflects what is in our heart is just pretty, uh, pretty stark. There's, there's tremendous consequences because if our mouth isn't changing uh, and the words that we use and say and the way we talk to people uh, isn't changing, what does that say about what's going on in here? It's a direct reflection. And so, how do we apply this to our daily life? I mean, obviously, as James says, uh, no one, he says in verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. So what do we do? The only person or the only thing that can truly change our tongue, as we've talked about it being a heart change, is the Holy Spirit working in our lives. That is why, to bring this full circle, it indicates where we are with Jesus and where we are uh, spiritually. So, in Galatians 5, when we're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit produces, uh, one of those things that is listed there is self-control. And then also, it, the other things are reflective of how our speech is supposed to sound as believers as we communicate with the rest of the body and with the people that God brings in to our circle. Kindness, patience, gentleness, all of these things. Love, these are all things that are supposed to be coming out of our mouth as we uh, work with and, and come across people. Uh, in our lives. We need to learn to reflect Jesus in our words. So Jesus actually spoke in such a way that his followers identified with his, him with his speech. He talks about being a good shepherd and the fact that in John 10 he talks about um, the sheep recognize his voice. They rec identify him by his voice and what he says. He calls his own sheep by his name and he leads them out. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. We, are, we develop a reputation, what people know about us, based on how we speak and how we treat people. And we need to learn to speak in a way that reflects Jesus and is constantly loving, gracious, and truthful. The next thing is our, our words can ruin our testimony. The things that we say can have a negative impact on uh, the kingdom. And Jesus warned people in Matthew 15 that they can discredit themselves by inappropriate, untrue, and unloving words. Matthew 15, 17 through 20. Jesus says, anything you eat passes through your stomach and then goes to the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. And that's what defiles you. From the heart will come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. So what he's saying is that we're each responsible for speaking in a right manner that reflects <laughs> Jesus. That reflects a consideration for others' concerns, perspectives, and feelings. We need to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. In Luke 12, Jesus recognized the importance of letting the Holy Spirit speak to each believer before they could speak on his behalf as a representative of his kingdom. Luke 12, 11, he says, And when you're brought to trial in the synagogue and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say. Verse 12 is, For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. God provides us through the Holy Spirit with the right things to say, to speak truth in love in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, we need to learn to listen to him. We need to be slow to speak and learn to speak at the right time. That's very important. In James 1.19, it says, Understand, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Again, patience 
is one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, and that directly affects what comes out of our mouth. And lastly, we need to surrender our tongue and our heart to Jesus. Billy was talking about, uh, you know, fully surrendering and the importance of that and that, you know, uh, it's difficult. I mean, a lot of times it's painful because there's a lot of times where we just want to, even in this, where we just feel like we have to say something, where we've just got to say the thing that, I mean, I don't know about you guys, there's been times where, um, you know, in my, in my past life where I felt the need to say something in order to prove a point or to prove somebody wrong. And it was hard. It's hard sometimes to hold back, surrender those words to the Lord so that they don't come out of our mouth, right? And so, um, Psalm, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so when you start your day, I guess I want to challenge you guys with a couple of things. The first would be learn to surrender control of your words to the Lord. Psalm 141, verse 3 says, Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. And then the second thing I want to challenge you guys with is ask the Holy Spirit to work in you each day so that your heart and your speech would bring Jesus glory. Psalm 19, 14, we've all heard this one. Um, but it's super, super applicable here. Uh, it's, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That should be the cry of our heart every day. As we go from here today, I just want to say one more thing, and that's out of Colossians 3.17, that um, it pretty much encapsulates everything. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. And so as we go to pray, I just want to encourage you guys to submit yourselves to the Lord in every area, in every aspect. And uh, surrender your tongue, surrender your words so that you can glorify Jesus and be a representative and a reflection of him in every area of your life. Let's pray. Hey, uh, real quick, um, we're going to meet for baptism afterward.